So a topic like preaching on the Psalms might seem initially appealing to people simply because the Psalms are some of the most deeply loved parts of the Bible. So many people universally love the Psalms. So I wonder why that is. I think the answer in part is because the Psalms not only speak to us, often they speak for us. They give us language for every season of the soul. Language when we're rejoicing, language when we're lamenting, language when we're thankful, when we're weeping, when we praise. So here's, here's a true confession. So this, this was a topic assigned to me simply because I just finished preaching a series through Psalms 1 to 41. Now, when the topic was assigned to me, my first thought on preaching the Psalms was this. This is no lie, true confession. Three words came to mind. Don't do it. I'm serious about that. That was the very first thought that came to my mind. I thought, this isn't going to be a very good seminar if I tell you how to preach from the Psalms and then say, don't do it. But here's here's why just immediately I felt that. Don't do it unless you want to be really stretched. Unless you want to really be forced to grow as a preacher, mind-stretching, soul-stretching, heart-stretching. That's what's happened for me in preaching through the Psalms. I mean, imagine going to uh, your traditional workout facility where you're kind of on your own, like at Planet Fitness or something, and you notice there's a lot of people that are doing workouts, mainly upper body, mainly bench press or arm curls or whatever, like that. You don't see a lot of people doing leg workouts on their own. And if they do, they're doing things with a lot of weight, like squats or leg extensions or things like that. You don't see many people on the hamstring curl machine. And I think in the same way, the Psalms, especially Psalms of lament, force you to work on underdeveloped preaching muscles, like lament. Lament is like the the leg machine, the hamstring curl of the Bible. Many of us are just not that equipped, not that used to handling psalms like that. And so here I want to say some of the things that the Lord has really worked on me personally with, things that have been underdeveloped. I thank God for entering into preaching on the psalms. Four things. I want to talk about in our time. Uh, Learning to lament has been a big one for me. Number two, learning to yearn for justice. So learning to lament, learning to yearn for justice, learning to look for the Messiah, and four, learning to love poetry. So before we dive into that, I'd like to pray. Father, we believe that your word is living and active. Like Luther said, it has arms, it grabs hold of us, it has feet, it pursues after us. God, do that. May the word of God right now be the arms of God that grab us again, grip our hearts, and give us a clear line of sight of the loveliness of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So first, learning to lament. We entitled the entire series of Psalms 1 to 41, book 1, Psalms 1 to 41. We entitled it Learning to Lament because it was such a dominant lesson for us as a church. It expanded our vocabulary, expanded our poetic ability to express lament together. And the Psalms here speak for us when the wounds run so deep, you're at a loss for words. You just don't know what to say because it hurts so bad. Often I just find myself in great disappointment turning back to these psalms, and there's language there. Don't draw the wrong connotation in your mind when you think lament. Lament is not a gripe session. It's not like the guillotine that cuts off the head of Christian hedonism or rejoicing in the Lord. Quite the opposite. A lament is the opposite of cynicism, Cynicism is like a lead balloon that never gets off the ground. And when you're crying out to God, cynicism would say, why cry out? Nobody will 
here, and nobody cares. Lament is the exact opposite. It's, it's filled, this balloon, with the helium of hope. As you cry out to God, you know, I'm crying out to the only one who really knows, who really cares, and who really is mighty enough to do anything about it. A lament is a weapon for the weak. It's when you're in a position where you just can't do anything about it. You've done everything that you can. We found ourselves in this place often when we were in the process of adoption. Like we had done everything that we could. We had sent all the emails we could. We had called all the people we could. And then I found myself just stuck starting to pray more. And it's like the Lord spoke to me out of that desperation and almost said, oh, you're praying now because you're so desperate and feel so dependent? The way you feel now is the way you always are. You're always this dependent. You're always this out of control. Control is such an illusion. And so here, when we reach the point where we realize we're so weak, so out of control, so dependent, suddenly lament becomes a weapon for us, a tool in the toolbox of joy. Those who know how to lament are children. Children know what to do when they don't know what to do. They scrape themselves and they cry out, Dad! They come running. And here, the children of God, when they scrape their souls in this world, they cry out to their Father. It becomes instinctual. That's what the Psalms teach us. And so, the, the Psalms of lament are essential for joy because they help us be authentic and not plastic in our fight for joy. When somebody says, hey, how are you doing? And you're tempted to just not get into a long conversation and tell them how you're really feeling, how you're really doing. How many times when somebody asks us how we're doing, does a lament come? It allows us to be authentic with that. And it clarifies where joy is not found. And it testifies to the only place where joy can be found in a lasting way. A lament says, look what happens when all other lights go out, we see that was not a source of joy, that was not a source of hope, that was not something to bank my life on, and there's one light left shining, and it's true. When you come to the place where Jesus is all you have, he's the only light left shining, then you find out he's really all that I need. That's what a lament does. In the dark, when all other lights go out, it testifies there's one light still left shining, one hope that can't be blown out. I'll give you an example in the Psalms. Sometimes suffering can be disorienting. So you hear in Psalm 1 about the, the blessed way of the righteous and the way of the wicked that will perish. So it looks like what the psalmist is saying, expectation management, is the, the righteous are going to be blessed, the wicked are going to be cursed. Enter Psalm 37 when it looks like it's been switched around. The wicked are prospering and the righteous are vulnerable and being attacked. It's like a game of Monopoly where you've got some of the kids that are cheating and some of the kids that are trying to play by the rules. The kids that are cheating are passing go and collecting $2,000 and buying up all the properties and the kids that are trying to play by the rules are getting poorer and poorer and losing. So it looks like the wicked are winning, cheating, and it looks like the righteous are losing. So what, what, do, you, what do you do? And the worst part about it is that dad, who told us not to cheat, looks like he's asleep on the couch and isn't doing anything about it. And the Psalms come along and say, in that situation, God's not sleeping. He's not asleep. He's going to come in just a little while, the wicked will be no more. He's going to come in judgment, and the meek will inherit the land. The board's going to be overturned. Everything that they got, the wicked, is going to be taken away from them. They're not going to be there anymore. And the whole board is going to be left for the righteous. You're going to inherit the earth. So the Psalms not only teach us to lament, but they also teach us to yearn for that day of justice, that day 
of judgment. So point two, they teach us to yearn for justice. The Psalms take neglected themes from the background of our preaching, like the justice and holiness of God, and they move them forcefully to the forefront. It makes God's justice just pop out in ways that sometimes we're uncomfortable. Psalm 7, verse 11, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. It says this about the Messiah too. Psalm 21, verse 12, you will aim your bow at their faces. We have a rule in our house when we play Nerf gun wars. The one rule is you cannot aim for the face. And here this says the Messiah is coming and he's aiming for the face of the wicked. What do you do with that? You're not going to see that cross-stitched on a pillow anywhere. It makes people feel uncomfortable. This, This image of God as a God of justice coming to take out the wicked. Can you pray this way? Can you teach your people to pray this way? Martin Luther said, you can't help but pray this way if you really understand what you're saying. He says, take the Lord's Prayer. Do you really know what you're praying when you say, your kingdom come, your will be done? Luther says, when we say, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, we're praying in opposition as well to all those things. So we're saying curses, maledictions, disgrace upon every other name, every other kingdom. May they be ruined and torn down, and may all their schemes and wisdom and plans run aground. It's what we're saying. Your kingdom come, meaning tear down every other kingdom that rises up against yours. Salvation in the Bible is nasty, bloody business. I was at a church in Louisiana when I taught as a professor there, and they they had a big mural thing on the wall for the nursery of Noah's Ark. It's like, here's the ark, and here's all the animals. You know, you got the elephant smiling and the giraffe sticking up his head smiling. Like, if you were to draw this as an actual scale, what about all the dead bodies in the water? You're not going to put that there. It's going to scare kids. It's supposed to be a happy picture. That's what the Bible is. When you say, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus, do you know what you're saying? You're saying, may the moment come when you come with the sharp sword and the blood will rise up to the level of the horse's bridle. Maybe it's not the Psalms that are so shocking. It's that we shockingly have misread the other parts of the Bible that say the same thing. And maybe we haven't realized it. So do you teach people to hope in God's holy anger? I find that people have the audacity to airbrush out parts of the Bible they don't like. They don't want to see. It's, it's such an abomination. Can you imagine somebody just going around putting a mustache on the Mona Lisa How much more God, if he is infinitely worthy to have some people just come and want to airbrush out some features about God that they don't, they're not quite comfortable with. And I understand why people do this. They try to tone down the terror of God's holy anger because they're trying to save the love of God. But when you tone down the wrath of God in order to try to save the love of God, you destroy them both. Because you got the gospel of its power, of its meaning. I'll give you an example of that. One time my friends dared me to eat an insanely hot pepper, seeds and all. And I was macho and stupid enough to do it. And when I did, I had never done this before. I mean, I'm from South Dakota. Spices were like salt and pepper. Okay, My friends got me to do this. And my mouth felt like a forest fire. Like It was so hot, I, I knew I was doing damage to my mouth. And they told me, that you need, they, they saw me crying, and they said, you, you need a glass of milk really quick. Like, wa- it's going to be better than water. 
And I swear to you, I have never wanted milk so badly in my life. And when I drank it, I was never so thankful for milk. The, the wrath of God, you don't want to tone down in its insanely hot power because you'll, you won't long for the milk of the gospel. You, you won't feel the necessity of it. If you tone down the terror, the heat of God's holy anger, you're not going to prize the milk of the gospel like you ought. So it creates within us this desperation for the gospel. That's right. Don't try to tone down God's holy anger. So then what it does, it teaches us to lament and yearn for God's justice. It also teaches us to be on the lookout for Christ. This is one of the most glorious things about the Psalms. Brothers and sisters, I can't tell you how many times over the course of preaching the Psalms, just got a clear sight, a clear line of sight of the loveliness of Christ and how my heart leapt, soared within me to see Christ in all of his various aspects and attributes. He's everywhere. We shouldn't be surprised by this. Jesus told us this would be so. When he opened the minds of the disciples in Luke 24 to understand all the things written of him in the law and the prophets and the Psalms. Law, prophets, and writings. He's there. So he, I, I had 40 pages on this. And I just, I'm just going to do this really quickly abbreviating it. We see the, the victory of Jesus over death in Psalm 2 and Psalm 16. Quoted in Acts 2, quoted in Acts 13, Paul says that, that God testifies to the resurrection, today you are my beloved son, today, today you're reigning in victory. Paul says that's the resurrection, that day, that day of enthronement. Or Peter says in his sermon in, at Pentecost, David was a prophet and looked ahead to see the resurrection of the Christ. His soul did not suffer decay. So we see the victory of Jesus over the grave. Psalm 8, we see that Jesus is the one who's going to bring the dominion over all of the earth that Adam failed to do, which is quoted in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. Psalm 22, we see that, that this Jesus is the one who brings in propitiation, the, the sacrifice that satisfies the wrath of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he is forsaken so that Psalm 22, 22 could be true for the people of God where Jesus says he's not ashamed now to call us his family, to present us before the Father. He was forsaken so that his people would never be forsaken and be brought into God's presence. He is the, the shepherd, the risen shepherd of Psalm 23, who in Revelation 7, 16, he's the shepherd in the midst of the throne who leads us to the springs of living waters. He is the Jesus in Psalm 24 who ascends on high in victory, and we say, oh, gates, open up. You everlasting doors, be open up. The king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? It's this Jesus returning in victory. We hear about the blessing in Psalm 1 that the word tells us about, this supreme happiness. And Psalm 2.12 says, the word of God points us to blessedness found in the Son of God. Blessed are those who find refuge in him. And then Psalm 32 says, this blessedness comes upon not those who keep the law perfectly, but on those for whom the Lord doesn't count sin. So Romans 4 quotes this as, this is the teaching of justification. Psalm 40, we learn about substitutionary atonement. I just have to go to this one. When I was preaching through the Psalms, this might have been my highlight moment, where we were, somebody was reading from Psalm 40, and they were just listening, got to verse 6, and the reading went like this. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, 
Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book, it's written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. And this person came up to me after the service and said, I had no idea that that was quoted in in Hebrews until you expounded that. But I was just listening to it read. And because of the way the Psalms had been read week after week after week after week, I heard those words and I, I stopped in my seat with my heart and said, that's talking about Jesus. I know it. Before Hebrews even said it, he didn't know what Hebrews had said. He just saw it. This is talking about Jesus, not David. And then when you turn to Hebrews, you see it's even more magnificent than you thought. Because Hebrews is looking at this and saying, there's two words for delight. In sacrifice and offering, you've not delighted, but you've given me an open ear. I I hear now burnt offering and sin offering, you've not required. So there's a replacement of the sacrificial system. God's not delighting in them. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book, it's written of me. It would be preposterous for David to be saying, I've come, just like the book said I would. This is talking about the Messiah. And then verse 8 says, I delight to do your will, O my God. So what's happening here? Why is it that Hebrews can read this and see, this is talking about the end of the sacrificial system. Hebrews 10.5 says the I have come refers to the coming of Christ. Hebrews 10 reminds people that the sacrifices of the law couldn't cause the remission of sin. They were only a reminder of sin. Sacrifice after sacrifice, reminder of sin. You needed a permanent sacrifice to perfectly remove sin. So where would this perfect, permanent sacrifice be? The question is, what was wrong with the sacrificial system? Was it the principle of substitution? Hebrews says, no, that's not what was wrong. It's the person of the substitute. It can't be an animal. It has to be a person. An innocent animal in the Old Testament takes the place of a guilty person, but it's never enough. It never takes away sin. Why? Ultimately, as sinners, we've willingly rebelled against God, and that's not the case with animals. They don't willingly obey or disobey. They do it as a matter of instinct, not will and choice. The animal can't fully choose and delight to be a substitute. It doesn't understand fully. It doesn't consent fully, not willingly. And yet now everything changes when a sinless person comes and obediently accepts the call, willingly to offer himself as a sacrifice, willingly, consciously, fully. Psalm 40 says, Christ came to do the will of God with a whole body. So when Hebrews quotes it, he says, a body you have given me. And you're reading that and you wonder, well, the psalm said an ear, and Hebrew says a body. What's going on there? What's happening is this is a simple case of one part, the ear, standing for the whole, the body. And I think what's happening is Psalm 40 is saying there's a delight here in the person of the Son of God coming and not just offering an ear, but a head to have a crown of thorns upon a beard to be plucked out, hands to be crucified, feet to to have the spike driven through. It's exactly what Isaiah 50 said. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward, rather I gave my back to those who strike, my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I didn't hide my face from disgrace and spitting. The Lord God helps me. I've not been disgraced. I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. So here in the principle of substitutionary atonement, it's not like when God created the world. Psalm 8 says, just the work of his fingers. What an amazing statement that God made everything, and it's just his fingers. Like, did he not even use his wrist? Just makes everything. 
How much greater is our redemption than all of creation in that? It's not just the work of God's fingers. It's the work of all of God's body. All of Christ coming to save all of us perfectly so that there's no need anymore every day for sacrifices to be offered. The one perfect sacrifice came as a whole body and said, it's all to save you. All of it. That preaches, brothers and sisters, that preaches. And that's exactly what the psalm says. You're not having to read things into it. Hebrews is reading what it says. So, you learn to lament, you learn to yearn for God's justice, you learn to love being on the lookout for the Messiah in so many different ways, and you also learn to love poetry. That's probably been one of the most stretching things for me. I didn't grow up reading poetry. I'm not like Pastor John, and I'm a poet I write poems for my wife, and they shouldn't be published. They're not any good. So here, I had to learn a lot to learn to even enjoy poetry and what was happening. And now it's really a love of mine. To to learn how to outline not the logic of a Pauline paragraph or the scenes of a Mark narrative, but the movements of a stanza as you move through a psalm. And you see that you almost need an emotional outline to understand what's being sung. So take my favorite psalm that I preach, Psalm 23. I had already loved that psalm until I really saw the beauty of its structure. Psalm 23, its main point, comes at the beginning. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Meaning, because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I have everything that I need. I'm surrounded by his shepherding care. Then the rest of the psalm gives you a picture of that. This is so beautiful. You're so surrounded by his shepherding care that you can look beneath you and you see green pastures. You can look beside you and you see still waters. You can look within you and find a restored soul. You can look ahead of you and see he leads me in paths that are right for his namesake. He doesn't take wrong turns. I can look around me and see all that's against me, even the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death. But I look around me and I'm not afraid because I see the one who's with me, leading me through. I look behind me and I'm not the kind of person that's going to feel like the, the next bad thing is ready to overtake me. I look behind me and I see goodness and mercy pursuing after me. And I look all the way forever in front of me and I know I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The psalm's very structure wants to make you feel surrounded as you look in seven different directions and everywhere you look, you're not alone. You see your shepherd. That's what the poetry does. Or take Psalm 29. What happened to me so often, this is no exaggeration, almost every week I would go to a new psalm And I was always ready, like the the big ones that I already knew, like Psalm 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 27, Psalm 37. I knew those, was really ready to preach on those. There was a lot that I didn't know. And I would get done with it, and I would say, where has this psalm been all my life? This might be my new favorite. Then the next week, I'd say, this might be my new favorite. Psalm 29 is an example. I love what Spurgeon said in his commentary on this. Just as the eighth psalm is to be read by the moonlight when the stars are bright, the 19th psalm needs the rays of the rising sun to bring out its beauty. So this psalm is best rehearsed when beneath the black wing of tempest, by the glare of lightning, amid the dusk which heralds the war of elements, the verses march to the tune of thunderbolts. God is everywhere conspicuous, and all the earth is hushed by the majesty of his presence. My favorite phrase there was, this tune, it marches to the tune of thunderbolts. I thought, that's beautiful, but is that true? The poetry is actually saying exactly that. 
Psalm 29 is saying the king of glory shows his royal strength and splendor in the storm. So you begin in the first two verses by having the glory in heaven with all the heavenly beings ascribing glory and honor, bowing down in worship, and then you see God's glory displayed on the earth, and then you see the king of glory himself. So as you read through the psalm, what you start with is a quatrain, which means you've got four of these lines. The first three are the repetition of the word ascribe. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. And you get three times, ascribe, ascribe, ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. But then you get that we must bow. Bow before the Lord. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. So everywhere, what the angels are doing is this revelation and response rhythm. They see something about God, they ascribe it to God, and they bow down in worship. All theology in heaven is always leading to doxology. Everything we see about God, the angels see, becomes immediately translated into praise. That is challenging when you think about on earth as it is in heaven. We want all of our theology to be leading to doxology like that. But then you begin to see God's glory on the earth through a storm. In verses 3 through 9, there's so much happening here with the storm starting at the sea. In verses 3 to 4, moving across the north. In verses 5 to 7, finishing in the south of Palestine. Verses 8 to 9. So you're just following this storm. And there's supposed to be worship happening. And this phrase, voice of the Lord, occurs staccato-like seven times, which is meant to be like the rumbling of the thunder over and over, rumbling, the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord. These are thunderbolts that we're hearing. So the storm begins at sea, verse three, the voice of the Lord is over the waters, the God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Now it sweeps across the north. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf, Syrian like a wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. So now you get this division, like flashed forks of lightning. Flash, flash, flashing forks of lightning coming out. Then it goes across the south. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness, shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. So you're in the cedars of Lebanon. Now you come to the wilderness of Kadesh. And the ESV says, the voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, all cry glory. There's a footnote that I think is much better in the ESV. Verse 9, I think, should be translated, the voice of the Lord makes the oaks shake. So you're watching this storm start in the sea, go across the north, and just break all of these huge trees like twigs. And then you see as the wind goes and it shakes all of the oaks so that they're all left bare. There's no leaves left on them. And then all on this temple in earth cry glory. So the earthly temple is a copy of the heavenly one. The heavenly one is all saying glory, the splendor of his majesty. And now the earthly copy is watching this storm and God's power. And they're saying the same thing, glory. God is glorious. And then you come all the way back up in verses 10 to 11. And you see the king himself. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood the Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. This word for flood is the word used only in Genesis 6 through 9 to refer to the great flood. What's happening here, if you've ever had kind of a rumble of injustice in your own heart, that's what this storm represents. It's like a movie trailer. 
anticipating the, the epic storm of final judgment. God's justice is going across the earth in power, and his justice is going to one day come in even greater wonder than this. Think about the average lightning strike. Should you be impressed as you see it? It's over six miles long. It reaches temperatures of over 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That might mean nothing to you. I had to look it up. What does that mean? In comparison to what? That's four to five times the heat, the temperature of the surface of the sun. Just flashing across the earth like that. And God's holy anger and justice is greater, is hotter than that. And so we're supposed to be watching this and seeing judgment is coming. He's standing over the flood. This judgment is coming. But then you read it in comparison to Psalm 28, and you see this is like the call. Psalm 28 is like the, the signal for, for Batman. Psalm 29 is like the, the Batmobile now coming. David in Psalm 28 is lifting up his voice in a cry for justice and ask that God not be silent. Psalm 29, God responds seven times with the same word, the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord. He's not silent. David asks him to come, and God says, I'm going to ride my thunder chariot across the plains, across the length of this land, and you'll see my glory. This is like Deuteronomy 33, 26. He rides through the heavens to your help on the clouds in his majesty. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. God is showing everybody across this land his great glory and power. So how could there possibly be peace for his people if they're sinful? What you see in the Psalms is that the wicked refuse to submit to his rule. The nations rage and they say, let's break his bonds apart. We're not going to submit to this Lord and to his Messiah. And so here they are, humanity in rebellion against God doesn't want to kiss the scepter, they want to hold the scepter. They want to be their own king, their own God, call their own shots. And what they don't realize, they think they're holding the scepter, they're holding a lightning rod. And judgment is coming. So how could there be any peace for God's people if we're sinners too? What happens, Psalm 22 says, is that the Son of God leaves the courts of heaven. And for all of his people, he grabs the lightning rods of their sin and, and takes them on the cross, lifted up, and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me in the judgment of the storm? And everything becomes black, and God's wrath is poured out on him. He takes our lightning rods away so that we're saved, so that we can have peace so that we can be in his presence forever. What I found over and over and over again is that preaching the Psalms means you can preach Christ and it's always fresh and never frozen. Wendy's has nothing on the Psalms. It, it doesn't become tired and dry and the same way of saying it every week. Think about the way that the Psalms are interpreted in the New Testament. I'll close this way. Here's the story that I see. You read a psalm like Psalm 14, and you wonder to yourself, how am I going to preach this? So let's go to one of the ones that looks kind of difficult. Psalm 14, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Now how are you going to preach that? If you're tracking with Psalm 1, you're wondering 
okay, is this talking about the, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked? Are we just talking about the way of the wicked? It's the fool that says in his heart there's no God, and God looks down on the wicked, and he sees that none are good. When Paul quotes this in Romans 3, he quotes it to refer to all of us, every single sinner. Whether you're the, the Romans 1 kind of fall, or you're an irreligious sinner, or whether it's the Romans 2 kind of fall, or you're a self-righteous sinner, he makes the point that all of us, Jew and Gentile alike, are under sin. And so the picture here in the Psalms, we wonder, how do you ever become part of the assembly of the righteous in Psalm 1? We instinctively read the Psalms as if it's all about us first and foremost. We're the righteous, other people are the wicked. The wicked are those people who are really bad, the ones who never come to church, you know, not like us. What I find again and again in the Psalms is our self-righteousness is directly addressed. You think about the Psalms having, you've heard the story of the three bears. This is the story in Psalms of the three chairs. You've got God's throne in heaven, and you've got the chair, the seat of the righteous, and the seat of the wicked. And all of us, instinctively in the church especially, think oh, we're sitting in the seat of the righteous. And then you've got those other people out there that are in the seat of the wicked. And suddenly the Psalms come along and Paul interprets it this way to say, excuse me, you're in the wrong seat. Didn't you hear? There's no one righteous. There's no one who does good. There's not even one. So at the end of this, you see there's no one sitting in the seat of the righteous and we're all alike under sin. And you have to get to that point before you can ever get to the gospel and the wonder that this Jesus, the Son of God, comes from heaven and he lives a sinless life. He is the only one sitting in the seat of the righteous, the only one that perfectly does not walk in the way of the wicked and sit in the seat of scoffers. He perfectly obeys. He alone is there. But then, Psalm 22 says, shockingly, in order to save us, he leaves the seat of the righteous and comes and takes his seat on the seat of the wicked and says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He takes our blame, pays our debt in order to take us from the seat of the wicked to join the assembly of the righteous, Psalm 22, 22, where he says, he's not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters and takes us all the way up to his Father, where we are welcomed forever. That's the story again and again and again in the Psalms. So if I began by saying, what would I say about how to preach the Psalms? I'd say, don't do it. I'm saying now, if you want to be stretched, if you want a heart that begins to burst with adoration of Jesus and all the ways that he's presented. If you want to have an accurate view of the world and of the wrath of God and of the preciousness of the gospel and wonder at the loveliness of Christ, do it. Preach the song.